Gerard is a businessman who's been interested in pagan beliefs, witchcraft and mysticism all his life. What people call witchcraft these days consists of very many things, but one branch is the old pre-Christian religion that is alleged to have been practiced in this country. It would have been practiced by the people who built the tumuli, such as the one we're sitting on now. It would have been the religion of that time that interested me as a boy. Now, people have got to have something with a religious overtone to turn to. And, you know, there's now very little mysterious to do for those who want something a little offbeat. And there's still this, this um, idea of secrecy, slightly perhaps naughtiness, about being a witch, I suppose, that appeals to an awful lot of people. Is this that we've done it that way because of a letter I had to Malik this morning. He wanted I've known a case really quite remarkable where a group of people performed uh, a ritual up on a Sussex Hill one night, and after the ceremony was over, they were all asked not to discuss what they had seen in their visions but to write it down on paper and send it to the group leader. Everybody in that group, which consisted of nine people, had experienced basically the same vision. They had seen even the same colors. Even the horse on which a knight was seated, uh, each person saw that horse the same color. Remarkable. You were one of those. I was, as a matter of fact. The uh, Witchcraft Act was repealed in 51, and since then people came bobbing out from under every stone, and we found that people were getting extremely interested, but had nothing to pick Ruth is the high priestess of a coven, which meets at her home in the country. She was brought up as a Christian, but was also taught much about the beliefs and mythologies of the pre-Christian period. When I was a little girl, my father used to tell me that our family was meant to be descended from a crow and a fairy lady. And the crow, actually, of course, is the god Bran, and the fairy lady, his sister, Gwenfran, or Blanwen. And uh, he also told me the, the legend about how they met and, and how all our family had the crow as a totem and it appears in the coat of arms and so on. To us, magic is not something ununderstandable. And I think that one day the laws of magic will be understood. They're becoming more and more understood. There's magic in the seasons, in being in love, in anything beautiful you see, in friendship, in all sorts of things that natural magic. People are now beginning to understand things like ESP, transference of thought and healing. Now all these things can be called magic and as you grow you find you're so much in it that you don't think of it as a second thing or something separate from your beliefs and your life. We always did keep the festivals just as people do now, they hold May festivals. And then we found that people were beginning to get very attracted towards witchcraft but we found that they'd got something that was just a bit wrong. So we decided that we would let our thing be known and sort of hand it out to other people. So we then began to firm the rituals, make them more, more definite. Who stands as sponsor for this man? We sponsor him, knowing him to be worthy. You know that you are answerable to the house for him, and you will help him Answer his questions and make him one with us. We know this and we'll do it. Do you all assembled here agree that he be adopted and accepted in... If found suitable, the new members of the coven go through a ritual of initiation. His child, ...and a child of the Lady of the Bright and Turning Tower. That, that is our wish. Then let him be born.
some groups work naked because they really feel that they're quite different when they're completely without anything that reminds them of their everyday life. They cast off their clothes and they are part of nature with nature and worshipping the gods and goddess through nature. And they really feel that they're much closer in that way. But um, we haven't because we work as much as possible out of doors and it's either too cold or too flyy. And also I do think it can lead to a certain degree of embarrassment. Our Lady the Moon waxes and wanes nine times while your spirit is renewed, while your body grows. My son, I acknowledge you as a true-born child of the House of Bran. From the gods to you, strength and newness of life have flowed. But now you must live separated, but strong, filled with the blood of the spirit. I breathe into you breath of life. The reason that people get Satanism mixed up with the old religion is because very early on, as I say, the church, at least in this country, and to a great extent on the continent, took absolutely no notice of the survivals. The Roman church very sensibly told them to adapt the old gods to become saints and to use the same places of worship, and they did to a great extent. They went along very well. Well, the church became more and more rich and unfortunately more and more corrupt. They also had this curious idea that everybody in the church must be celibate. So you had a hotbed of either people who were being celibate and were seething with misery and repressions, or people who were not and were therefore of a bad conscience. And the people began, after a while, to be irked by these people with so much money and so much in the way of possessions when the peasantry and the majority were in a dreadful state of poverty and sickness and one thing and another. And they became murmurings against the church. Now the church became insecure and frightened. And they had, therefore, to build up some sort of whipping boy. And therefore all the minorities suffered. One of the things people ask you as soon as they hear that you do anything like this is to heal, to help people who are ill. And one of the biggest pieces of work we do is this. Most of the people for whom we work have no idea they're being worked for. People will say, I have a friend who's terribly ill. They say it's a terminal cancer, whatever it may be. Please will your group work? We do. And the person doesn't know, because they'd be shocked to think that what they would call witches were working for them. We don't call ourselves that, or think of ourselves as that, but they would. And so it's not a case of people believing they're being worked for. We work without them knowing. And it works, but it isn't us. You're not doing it. Something is working through you. It comes through almost like an electric current. You don't try to point it off at the person who's ill. You may not know exactly where they are. That which sends it through you knows where to send it. The festivals are tied to the natural year. The beginning of the year is Halloween, which is the beginning of November. And that is when the my group, as my family, shall I say, though they're not as a group, had the great assembly. All the clans held their great assembly. And uh, it is because they called on also the souls of those who were dead, who had been, that has grown into Halloween, when they imagined souls wandering around, ghosts about the place, witches, etc. And that was the great festival of the year, when all the business of the 
house the family was done, and it was also, of course, a religious festival. Bendigite Bran, blessed Bran, my lord and brother, our lord and father. Not in my present form, but as Gwen Bran, I call on you. Not for myself alone, but for your people, your children, your family, your house, the plant Bran, the children. Today being the great assembly of the house at the beginning of the year, all have been called of our people. Those who were, those who are, those who will be. Ours by birth, ours by adoption, ours by brother right. Prince and father of our house, make it possible for all to come. Great bridge of imperishable alder, bridge for them the waters of birth, span for them the river of death. Oh, one of the chief beliefs in the old faith, and in a great many modern ones, is that of reincarnation. That we come from God, we are all a part of God. I say God now, not the goddess, because I mean the one that is above any god or goddess. Now, we come to this world carrying our little soul for each time and we learn as going to a class in school and we return to learn more and to learn more until we've reached a point where we no longer need to be forced to return or to come back because we wish to improve. And then you can choose. Will you come back and go on helping people? Blessed head, great crimson face of the sun, light their way as they journey to our great assembly. Now the spiral castle turns. May time cease for us as for them. And we may touch and know each other across the long years and the great spaces. Now we throw open the four great portals of a spinning town. Time stops as it stands still. The origin of festivities such as this at Abbots Bromley in Staffordshire lies centuries back in prehistory. begins to live. Yes, see, yes, and it's yes. a living tradition. It's gone on for year to year, you see, and it probably started as a hobby horse dance. Yes. And during the course of time, the horns have been introduced into the dance, and so the horns now lead the dance, but the central character is still the hobby horse. He has his, his characters that follow him, the man-woman, otherwise known as Maid Marian, and the pool, otherwise known as Jester. This, this poor chap, the hobby horse, is killed. Yes. You, you might have noticed, did you notice, you know, when they meet? They go yes, forward and yes, back. Yes, yes, As they go forward, the bow and arrow man pulls his, his arrow back and shoots the hobby horse, and he dies momentarily for the good of the community. It's death and revival, you see, death of winter, rebirth of spring, but in this village, of course, it's held in September.
boy who has a bow and arrow probably doesn't realize that yeah. he is enacting this particular yeah. ceremony of killing the horse. Long before Christianity, long before any organized religion, primitive peoples attempted to placate supernatural powers so that the rain would fall and the crops would grow. Primitive man practiced sympathetic magic, seeking fertility for himself and power over the animals he hunted. At the autumn festival of death and the spring festival of birth, he worshipped the horned god of the hunt, the masculine sun, and the moon, the great mother. Primitive practices survived into the Christian era. Throughout the Middle Ages, people believed in magic in a world they didn't understand. They believed in witchcraft and sorcery. Witches, folk believed, met at night by moonlight in the woods or in wild remote places. They flew on broomsticks or with animal familiars to the witch's sabbat, presided over by the devil in the shape of a goat. Most witches were women. At the sabbat, they danced naked with demons, or so went popular belief. <laughs> In the 15th century, the church, threatened by dissent and social unrest, sought to stamp out heresy and to crush witchcraft. In 1484, Pope Innocent VIII urged Christians to prosecute witches. Two years later, the manual compiled by the Inquisition, Malaeus Maleficarum, known as the Hammer of Witches, set down all that was known of witchcraft, black magic and heresy. Concerning witches who copulate with devils, it asked, why is it that women are chiefly addicted to evil superstitions? The male celibate church distrusted women. The inquisitors used unbearable tortures. Throughout Europe, witches confessed to all the practices their torturers put to them. Yes, they did meet at Sabbaths. Yes, there were orgies. Yes, they flew through the air on broomsticks and entered into contracts with the devil. Fantasies of the repressed unconscious found expression in the questions and answers. In England, torture was not allowed by the courts and the hammer of witches had little influence. Here, witches were frequently lonely, cantankerous old people, especially women, whom others in the village disliked and were blamed for the loss of a cow or a neighbour's illness. All the same, in England, hundreds died on charges of witchcraft. But, in Europe, from 1450 to 1750, hundreds of thousands of so-called witches were tortured to death or burnt at the stake. During the 18th century, witch beliefs gradually died out, and feelings about witches grew less extreme. Artists like Hogarth and Goya ridiculed the witch beliefs. The witch began to fade into a figure in children's stories with black cat, cauldron, broomstick and pointed hat. In the 19th century, we began to learn about primitive peoples. Anthropologists found that for societies throughout the world, witchcraft and magic were important. In the Golden Bough, Fraser pictured a universal fertility religion, sometimes including the ritual slaying of the divine king dressed as an animal. More recently, Margaret Murray assumed that there really were witches and argued that their practices represented one pre-Christian faith, the old religion. Most modern scholars disagree. They say there were witches, but no organized religion of witchcraft. But witchcraft somehow lives on into the 20th century. For some, witchcraft is the old religion and the beliefs that survive express truths buried deep in the collective unconscious of mankind. For others, magical ideas and practices, whether called witchcraft or not, are an essential part of their way of life. Witchcraft is part of the whole occult movement. I consider that I am part of the occult movement and that witchcraft is part of my practice. Janet so is a graduate of business studies and a practicing ritual magician. 
What do I do? Well, I make talismans, uh, some of the ones I'm wearing. Normally for clients who come to me with a particular problem and we link their energies with other outward energies. This is done by using their horoscope, making a talisman to suit them, consecrating it on my altar. It's a box for practical reasons. It means that I can take the things around with me. If I have to pack up and go and stay somewhere, I don't have to leave things which are precious to me here. I just put it all inside the box, lock it, and take it away. And when I want to set the altar up, I open it, put the things on the top, and use it. The altar is consecrated, of course, because um, it is an altar. I mean, it's not used for anything else. Nothing else is kept in it. At the moment, it contains things which I'm not able to show you. I see a mushroom on your altar. Yes. Um, this is the uh, Flyagric Amanita Muscari. It's the food the gods turned on. on. It's, um, it enables you to open your perceptive senses to a far greater degree than, than is otherwise possible. It has side effects, which I think make a lot of people not wish to try it. But the ultimate effects are fantastic. What, what, what are the effects? Well, chemically, you are inhibiting the oxygen and sugar intake to the brain, which is putting your physical body into a state of confusion. Uh, magically, you are releasing your unconscious without the interruption of reason. Now, all ritual magicians anyway have to learn to set reason aside when they're doing some kinds of work. But under this, it's not a question of your setting it aside, it is set aside. I go out onto my circle. I work my circle, that is, I move around it until I am myself the focus of power. I have power within me, power without me, building up into a cone. I go on with this until a certain amount of physical exhaustion takes place. And in the planetary hour, for the person concerned, I make the talisman. I invoke the forces to assist, consecrate it, in the four elements and send it to the person or give it to them. Astrology is a tool of magic. I have to be an astrologer to be a ritual magician because all your magical operations are set up at planetary hours, hours which are in relation to the cosmic force you are calling. And you obviously have to know when this is or else you have to pay somebody else to tell you. There are one or two magicians who don't bother with astrology, they just ring up astrologers and ask them. But it's not a good idea. What sort of people come to you and ask you to practice uh, ritual magic for them? Um mainly business people. Th this surprises a lot of people. You know, I have been asked this before and they say, oh, well, we suppose that it's only the ignorant who come to you. This is not true. By and large, the majority of my clients are very intelligent business people. I've got quite a number of teachers among them and lots of people who own their own businesses who will come to me and say, look, we're running into difficulties. Um, will you just have a look and see, is this something that I am personally doing, or is this part of the general setup of the firm? And you can usually track this thing for them. Norman calls himself a witch and has a special interest in herbs. He lives near Oxford. I was close to my father and I found that uh, after talking to him about here and hereafter, that uh, he was a good Christian, not like me, and uh, of course he said, well, nobody's ever come back to tell us. And um, I said, well, that's a pretty poor business. Would you try and come back? I mean, you're bound sure to die before me. And he said, yes, well, I don't see why not. So uh, once you could get his word on a thing, I knew he would do his damnedest to do so. But still, that didn't help me any, because when he died, I missed him awfully. And uh, after he'd been dead about three or four weeks, I still missed him. And I remember going to bed one night, and in the middle of the night, I woke up with a start and sat up, bolt upright, and there he was, by the side of the bed. And I looked at him like that, 
And I said, goodness me, I thought you were dead, Governor. And he laughed and he said, ah, oh, I think you, we know now, don't we? We know now, don't we? And, he, and his laugh, as his laugh disappeared into the distance and, and the sound went with it and that was that. And I never missed him ever, ever anymore after that. The real old Cornish people, like my grandmother, the Berries, were a very old Cornish family. And of course, they had never really, I don't think, until they came down these parts uh, of being very far away from the old Celtic beliefs, which were very, very strong. It, it, it just comes out. Perception, clairvoyance, clairaudience, all those kind of things. That, you read about them when you're quite young. I started to read when I was about eight, you see, and and I realise, you realise somehow or another that you're apart, a man apart. From time to time, young people interested in witchcraft and the occult approach Norman and ask him for advice and training. If they come to me, nowadays I always inquire their circumstances, uh, whether they're married, single, or so on and so forth. Nowadays, I like to get a, a glance at their palm and read that pretty thoroughly first. And I make sure then that there are no snags nor trip-ups because you want somebody that, uh, that uh, is pretty level-minded, level-headed. There are slight dangers to training, like everything else. And anybody that is of an excitable nature, it just might not be suitable for. This here is the cowslip. These cowslips are used for wine, beautiful wine, also for pastries and things like that. The comparison between the ordinary conventional herbalist, he has in mind only the, the curing of his patients, whereas with the witch proper, it is to heighten the, the imagination. Once the mind has to be keyed on to a particular subject, with the aid of an hallucinatory uh, drug, then this can be heightened and therefore produce certain required effects or certain knowledge obtained. But one needs careful study on these matters. Oh, right, looks rather like a potato. Yes. <laughs> Tomato also, if it was done. Ah. This is um, the Virginian poke from America. How's that for? I uh, don't say that. Oh. <laughs> uh, this here is vervan. It's one of the best nerve tonics I know of. Of course, mm. it's a little bit gone over now. Uh, there, just there, we have the uh, deadly nightshade, which is used for... It has blackberries, doesn't it? Yes, it has a large cherry, black cherry on it there. Mm. And uh, it's used to, for opening the pupil. It's used in eye operations and things like that. Very, very poisonous, best left alone. Oh, Water yes. avens here. This is sometimes used in smoking mixtures. Gives it body, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is Eau de Cologne, right? It's uh, lovely. More in tune with things that the ladies require. Mm, lovely. I find then, uh, next to that, you give them six or seven things to do to see whether you can make them into a fully-fledged student, probably of use to yourself and of use to the community as a whole. You're interested in it. Can you give the colours? Well, it's, it was green around the outside and then red sort of in a sort of ring. Yes. And then the light in the middle, but then it sort of goes into a sort of blue blob yes. and, and sort of navy blue sort yes. of flash. Now can you mm. concentrate a little harder? If I concentrate really hard, it's a red and I've lost it. A, a try harder concentration this time. I don't really believe that anybody can be bewitched. I mean, they can be terribly frightened, although I have known people who have believed that I and other people had super normal powers, and this is not so. Any person can become a strong man by continuously pulling on some wires 
the same as any one of us can have a super normal gift by simply constant practice. It's the same with palmistry or anything like that, oh. constant practice. And I find I sort of lose it. It's, sort of... it's not making you tired or sleepy. No. Mm -hmm. Should it be? <laughs> no, no, it should not. I know that, as a rule, the power passes only to a female. Red, like but uh, in my case, not Dancing. so. Yeah. It's inherited. Dancing. I think Dancing. that no, when I have had successful pupils who have worked with me, that there has been quite a great amount of unison, enough to make what we would call a matched pair. Two people that know and can sense one another very keenly this is a power that can pass between one and the other. Now, if they're both clairvoyant, they're both clairaudent, they're both conscious of the job in which they're going to do, that is to summon up elves, gnomes or fairies. The position which is chosen is always an old spot, an old Celtic wealth. They can bathe in this spot they can come out, then the photographs of the elves or gnomes are taken as fast as is possible. The female generally stands in, but a distance has to be worked of something like 30 feet, which means that the blow-ups are a little indistinct at times. This is the side of plenty of course. Norman was trained as an artist, and some of his paintings reflect his interest in the occult and the supernatural. This god is the god of magic. One or two things about him I've never really understood why he always had this splendid woolly jacket. Move on to more things that are nearer to heart, elves, gnomes and fairies, copies from old prints and things like that, rearranged, recolored by me. Christians go to heaven, I suppose, and the witch goes to the Summerland. That is just an expression. But the Summerland is a place where pain and suffering disappear, where one lives a happy, contented life, where one is free to join one's ancestors. We believe a lot in joining our ancestors, you know. I suppose there's something Chinese in me. I always look at it as a joke, you know. I always think that uh, what was good enough for my ancestors is good enough for me. And at Padstow in Cornwall, at the May Festival, they still celebrate the revival of spring just as their ancestors have done for centuries. Most of the people celebrating the May Festival today, all this no longer has any religious basis. But for a few, this is still part of the old religion. I think the most important part of any religion is the way it makes you live. Not what you say, but how you live. We can only influence those who come in contact with us, not by what might we say, but by never doing the wrong thing ourselves. It's a way of life. It is the way I think from the moment I get up and until night time, I am it. It is a complete religion, if you like, any more than a religion, because it has some practical results.
if you've had this mystic vision, you, you don't question it. You know it's absolutely incontrovertible. And we know full well that modern science will prove that this is a fact. Not asking people to know, to believe, or acts of faith, but to know modern science is verging on the time now when it will show that these things are a practical reality. <laughs>